Amen. The youngins are headed to the back. Take your Bibles. Turn to John chapter 3. In the book of John, chapter 3. Verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. And the same came to Jesus by night. And said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh. Whether it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How? can these things be drop down to verse 15 that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. And he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds, their deeds were evil. I want to preach to you a message this morning titled the greatest teacher teaches the greatest lesson. The greatest teacher teaches the greatest lesson. Heavenly Father, God, we love you this morning. Thank you for, again, the opportunity to be in your house. And Lord, I know we're down in number this morning, but Lord, you've told us where two or three are gathered together in your name. Well, you're there also. So Lord, help us to be up in spirit. Give us a renewed spirit this morning, whatever the struggle may be. Lord, help us to be encouraged, uh, to just seek your face. Lord, to know that you're the joy. You're the joy in our lives. Lord, free me of self. Cleanse me of sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit now. In Jesus' name, amen. I was just thinking this, even this morning, there is a teaching out there that says that those in the Old Testament could not be saved, but that they were saved through works, works of sacrifices. And this is a teaching that is prevalent even in Baptist churches, even amongst independent Baptists. And this is free this morning. But I just want to tell you, it's very interesting. They'll tell you that salvation did not come until Jesus' death on the cross. I find it very interesting that Jesus has not died yet, but is standing there looking at somebody and saying, Believe. Now, uh, there's a lot of folks that would disrupt a little bit, but when Jesus hadn't died yet, and hadn't shed his blood yet, and says, Believe, and you can be saved, well, uh, either, either that's not works, folks, that's belief. So when Jesus says, all you got to do is just believe and put your faith and trust in Christ, that I, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go with Jesus. <laughs> uh, so I, that's free. And the only reason I say stuff like this because I know it's being recorded and it's going to bust somebody's bubble, but you tell me how to get around that and how people before the cross had to do it by works, 
and I'll bring you back to Jesus, and you can figure it out from there. I'm just ornery sometimes. I know. I'm working on it, though. I'm working on it. In our text, we see a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus here in chapter 3. And in his curiosity, he came to Jesus. And in verse 2, the Bible says Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, and by the way, he came by night. Because being a Pharisee during the day, he, he was a little, you know, he, he'd have been turned in and been turned on and probably would have lost his position had he had come to Jesus during the day and asked these questions. But he came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He's a teacher come from God. Somebody who has not put their faith and trust in Christ understands that Jesus, by the miracles that he's doing and by the things that he's teaching and the things that he's saying, that he's right. That his teaching comes from God. That there's something godly about what he's saying. And I think there's, there's a lot of messages here and I toiled with what even to preach on this morning. But I find it very interesting that that based upon what Jesus was teaching, he had to be godly. Okay, help me. Don't make me back up now. So let me put it to you plain. Based upon what was coming out of Jesus' mouth, somebody said, you've been with God. And by the way, as Christians, we're to be like Christ. So that kind of tells me that based on what comes out of my mouth, people ought to say, hey, you've been with God. Kind of a little bit of a lesson learned. There's going to be a lot of freebies this morning, okay? Y'all like freebies? I, I don't, uh, uh, I, I like to go to the state fair, but not, not for the rides. Uh, I go to the state fair every once in a while for the freebies. Amen. And the corn dogs. And those funnel cakes. And anything they can put in hot grease and deep fry. That's what I like. Uh, so I go, I go for that. But, but this morning, I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you some freebies. Those are freebies, okay? Uh, so, so understand that Nicodemus goes to Jesus and says, uh, we, we know that by your teaching, you know what you're talking about. You, you know that, we, we know that you're of God. And it's interesting, the, the wording here, uh, uh, he says uh, that the rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. You're a teacher come from God. The wisdom that Jesus would, ta would teach with them. By the way, Jesus had that since he was a little boy. You might remember when he was 12 years old, he uh, got left behind in Jerusalem. And when his mom and dad came back and found him, he was teaching in the temple. And he had, boy, he had the greatest teachers and the greatest minds uh, uh, and studiers of, of the Word of God. He had them sitting at a 12-year-old's feet listening to him teach. He had wisdom, he had knowledge, and he was the greatest teacher to ever live. He was a great teacher. Now, I'm going I'm to expound on that here in just a minute, but let me just kind of explain the text to you. He was a great teacher, and everywhere Jesus went, he taught. And you remember in the last couple of weeks, I told you that when Jesus would show up, uh, and he would perform a miracle. There were people that would come and they would just want to see the miracles. They would want to see, in their eyes, tricks. They would want to see something miraculous. And Jesus would tell the leper, he would heal him and say, Now, don't tell anybody. And I had always wondered that. And I, that was always fascinating to me, young in my ministry, why Jesus would heal somebody and then tell them, Don't tell anybody. Because they would want, at one point be leprous and they'd go back into the town. He'd say, no, Go show yourself to the high priest. Let him clear you. Do everything you need to do to get back with life. Get back on board with life and, and then move on. And, 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 but, but don't proclaim it. But those poor lepers, they'd get in town and tell everybody. I mean, I, I was once a leper and now I'm clean. And who did it? Jesus did it. Well, they'd all come running. Well, why were they coming to run? Listen, they weren't coming to hear Jesus teach anymore. They were coming to see him do a trick. And, and suddenly the truth in what is being taught is being overshadowed by the miracles that Jesus was doing. And that's why Jesus would say, don't tell anybody, because Jesus wants people to hear the truth. There's something when Jesus would do a miracle or when he would teach, 
there is something he wanted the people to listen and hear what he was saying. And even today, we have the Word of God. We have the Bible. And that cry is still out there today. Listen, God wants us to get into his Word and hear what he has to say. It's, it hasn't changed. And so here, Nicodemus says, You're a great teacher come from God. And he was a great teacher. And then in the, in the, in the verses ahead, Jesus begins to teach Nicodemus and the disciples something. And we'll get to that here in a minute. But the first point this morning I want you to see is that he wasn't just a great teacher come from God. He was the greatest teacher and he was God. He wasn't just a man. He was the God man. He was God in flesh. He wasn't just great. I just sometimes I wonder in verses like this if they just they were just looking for a better word to describe him. I mean, what word can you use to describe Jesus Christ? Great. He's great. He's a great teacher, and what he taught was great. But I need you to understand, first of all, yes, he was a great teacher. And yes, his teachings are great, but he's so much more than just great. He's God. He's God. In John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. goes on to say, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. I love this. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Now watch. His name as a child, as a baby, shall be called the Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. John chapter 10, verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, uh, my Lord, my God. John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now that's very key, because I'm going to get into that here in a minute about Jesus being great. We're going to get into the, 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 the idea of him being I am. I am means he, he's everything. He is the beginning and the end. He, he, is, he is and was and will be forever. He was God. That's what he was saying. He's God. He was more than just a great teacher. He's a great God. He was God in flesh. But then he goes on to teach something. And he's not wasn't just a great teacher, but he had a great lesson for us to learn. And in verses 1 through 12, he teaches Nicodemus and the disciples that you must be born again. And in verses 13 through 20, he tells us and focuses on the fact that not only must you be born again, but you must believe. You have to believe on me. And it's interesting that Jesus is saying, you got to believe me. you got to believe what I'm telling you. You have to believe. you got to put your faith and trust in me. And as I said when I started this out, that there are many who believe that in this doctrine of works, that before the cross, it was a work-type salvation. Well, that's just not what's going on here. Jesus said, you got to believe. you got to put your faith and trust. You, you must be born again if you're going to be saved. And it's the greatest lesson that was ever taught. The greatest, if you will, Sunday school lesson. The greatest message that Jesus ever taught was that you must be saved. The Bible said that Jesus, listen, Jesus didn't come to do miracles. Jesus did, And he did miracles. Jesus didn't come to keep the party going. Jesus didn't come just to do great things. The Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the whole purpose of Jesus coming. The whole purpose of Jesus coming, being born of a virgin, being a lady in a major, living 33 and a half years, the whole purpose of him coming was to go to an old rugged cross. That's why he came, to die, to shed his blood. He came to save. It's the greatest lesson he ever taught. 
Paul preached that very same message. Again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Paul was not a very, uh, I don't know that he was a very interesting preacher. And I don't know that Paul was a, a, a great orator. But I know this, everywhere I see Paul preaching, he preached Jesus Christ crucified. Jesus came to save. I once was lost, but now I'm found. You read it. Every king, every potentate, every, every uh, royal uh, uh, being that he stood in from, he said, hey, I used to persecute Christians. I was a sinner. I was the chief, cheapest of sinners. Jesus appeared to me. I was blind. Then I got my sight back. Then he saved me. And now the very same Jesus that you crucified, every time he preached, it's what he preached. What's he preaching? He's preaching the same message Jesus preached. You need to be saved. I get that as pastors and as teachers and as Sunday school teachers and as workers, there's other doctrines in the Bible and things that we can teach on and things that we can preach on. But there is no greater message, there is no grace, greater lesson to be taught than that, that you must be born again. Jesus came that people might be saved. He was the greatest teacher to ever teach. And he taught the greatest lesson that there is to be taught. And that is, you must be born again. John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Romans 10, 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's the greatest lesson we can teach. It's the greatest message that we can preach. It is one of salvation. John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. It's a salvation message. Nicodemus said you're the greatest teacher. And so Jesus taught the greatest lesson that could be taught. But I, I want to just give you a couple other things here though about how great Jesus is. Since we're talking about him being a great teacher, he was not just a great teacher, but the Bible tells us that he was the great physician. I was thinking of the woman with the issue of blood. The Bible says that she had spent all she had, given up all the resources. She had uh, tried doctors. She had tried medicines. She had tried therapy. She tried essential oils. She tried powders. That's a joke, y'all. It's okay. Lighten up. I tell people all the time, uh, uh, my wife uses, she likes those essential oils. I, I'm not a big fan of essential oils, but hey, when you're married to a good-looking woman and she's rubbing oil on you, hey, praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> you say, you believe that stuff works? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I'm not. Yeah, that was a rabbit I should have never chased. I can tell you that right now. A woman with the issue of blood. She tried everything. And then she was left with only one thing left to do, and that was to go home and slowly bleed to death and die. And I studied that one time, and, and for the sake of uh, uh, maybe some of the crowd here today, and I don't, again, don't want to necessarily go places I don't need to go, but, but she was considered unclean. She had a flux. She was bleeding, and it never stopped. And, 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 it, and no doubt she was pain in pain and, and the cramping and, and, and the, the idea of uh, 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 the type of disease that she would have if, 
if she banged herself, she would bruise easily and scab easily. And, and a lot of people on blood thinners understand that. If you're on blood thinners, you, you just get a paper cut. You think you're bleeding to death. Everything just starts oozing out, you know. And she has this illness, and, she, and she's not getting any better. And she's weak, and she's frail. And nobody wants her. No, she, She's lost everything. She's lost her income. She's lost, now watch, she's lost all hope. But she heard Jesus was coming. <laughs> Jesus is coming down, and there's a mob, and there's a crowd around her, and the disciples are around him. And, 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 and this woman says, I, I've got one last thread of hope. If I can just get enough energy, and maybe if I can just touch him, if I can just get his attention, I can't prove this. And, and, and I'm not trying to go places or add to Scripture. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I, I'm not trying to take away from what the Scripture is, and I can't prove it. But I almost get the idea that she's trying to just touch him and, and grab him. I mean, that's the idea I get when I read the story. The, 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 the intention of her reaching out and touching the hem of his garment is almost unintentional. I get the idea that she's trying to, like, get a hold of him. And, and somehow she winds up on her knees. And I, I preached that one time, and, and, and uh, it's interesting. Somebody confronted me on that and said, the Bible doesn't say that she was knocked to her knees. I said, well, you stop and think about it. The Bible doesn't say that she was knocked to her knees, but when Jesus saw her, he looked down at her. Well, how did she get down there? The mob, maybe, the crowd knocked her. I don't know. Again, I'm not adding to Scripture. I'm just saying, how did she get down there? How did she reach the hem of his garment? She didn't reach the hem of his garment here. She reached the hem of his garment because she was on the ground. And I get the idea that she's grasping and she's reaching and she's trying to give it all. She's got one last thread of hope. She had heard about Jesus and she's in the crowd and she's frail. And, and by the way, if she didn't, if Jesus couldn't help her, she was probably going to get trampled to death. I mean, she's weak, she's frail, she's sick. And Jesus come by and she just lunges and she reaches. And the tip of her finger, I mean, the tip just runs across the hem. And Jesus stops. I mean, you want to talk about the greatness of God. You want to talk about the greatness of Jesus. The tip. And Jesus stops and looks at Peter. Who touched me? The disciples look at Jesus and say, you're nuts. What do you mean who touched? The, now watch. The crowd throngs you. Everybody's touching you. Jesus said, ah, not like this. I feel virtue has left me. Jesus turns around. And it's almost as if she's huddled on the ground. And she looks up in fear because now everybody's looking at her. But she doesn't look the same way she looked. Virtue is flown from me. And Jesus looks at her and says, I've made the faith alone. I want you to know something. When you've lost all hope and when you think all hope is gone, he's still the great physician. He still answers prayer. And over and over again, I see it all the time. Everybody just upset about Russia, Ukraine, and this and that, and the world, and gas prices, and everything else. Hey, he's still God. He still answers prayer. Have we forgotten that he's still great? He's great. He's more than great. i got to get through a bunch here in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Not only is he the greatest teacher with the greatest message and the great physician, he's the great I am. I, when I started putting this outline together, I said, I can't do another part two on a Sunday night, so I'm going to try. I'm going to move very quickly. Do you understand the great I am is referred to great, the great seven statements that he made throughout the book of John? things that Jesus said I am but it goes back to Exodus when Moses stood before the burning bush and and God looked at Moses when Moses said who shall I tell Pharaoh sent me 
And God said, tell them I am. Now watch. God speaking through the burning bush said, tell them I am sent you. And now we see Jesus Christ walking the earth in his ministry. And you know what he's using? He's using the same terminology. It doesn't sound like it when we read the English version. But God looks at Moses and God says, tell them I am sent you. Jesus is walking around looking at people going, I am. And that's why the Pharisees were so upset. Because the Pharisees had read in the Hebrew language where God said that God is I am. And now here's this man standing there going, I am. And they're going, no, you're just a man. And Jesus going, no, I am. No, you ain't. Yes, I is. Jesus kept saying, I am. I am the great I am. If, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father in me. I am. I am the Father. They didn't understand that. And it became blasphemy. The accusation, matter of fact, the whole reason Jesus was crucified, what he was found guilty of was blasphemy. He declared him, what? They crucified him because Jesus said he was God. And then he rose from the dead and proved he was God. Amen. Guilty as charged. He's I am. And i got to go through these very quickly. Uh, I am means in, in John chapter 10, in verses 11 through 13, he says, I am the good shepherd. What did, what did he mean by he was the good shepherd? He is the one who would lay down his life for his sheep. He was the one who would give his life on an old rugged cross for those that believed on him. He said, in that same context, he said, I am the door. He's not just the one who would give his life for the, the shepherd who would give his life for his sheep, but he is the door to the sheepfold. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What Jesus said. In other words, Jesus said, there's only one door. Don't be fooled by uh, uh, some of the religions that, that are out there today that say there's many ways. Nope, ain't but one door. Only one door. Only one way in. One way out. Well, praise the Lord, once you go in his door, you don't come out. I, I, I caught myself all that one for a minute. There's one door. One door. No, no others. In John chapter 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. It, it's Jesus Christ who brought light into a darkened world. It was Jesus Christ who was a pillar of fire and a light guiding the children of Israel through the wilderness. He's the light. It's that same aspect. It's that same idea that Jesus is a light to the world just as God lit the way. Again, God was I am to the children of Israel. Jesus is I am to the Jew. They're the same I am. In John eleven twenty five, 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. You know, it's interesting. You know, without Christ, you really have no life. The Bible says you're condemned already. You have no life. He is that. It, what? it was God, I am, who breathed into the nostrils of man and gave man life. It is Jesus Christ, I am, that gives us fullness of life. It's still the same I am. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And again, there's one way, not multiple ways. In John 6, 35, he said, I am the bread of life. You know, it's interesting. Some of these, and we don't have time to get into a study on these this morning. Maybe perhaps we'll, we'll get into a series moving forward. You could do a seven-week series. I could preach an entire message on each one of these. But what, what, what Jesus is saying is that as a Christian, if you're here saved this morning, folks, you cannot walk your Christian life without spiritual food. 
You cannot be effective in your spiritual walk if you do not have spiritual food. Your car is no good if it does not have gas. And these days, cars may not be any good moving forward if we have to pay, pay what we're paying. But he's the bread of life. He's that. Jesus is that that nourishes your spiritual walk. I am. He's the true vine. In John 15, 1, he said, I am the true vine. It's interesting. It is through Christ that we bear fruit. And again, there's a whole deep study there. But without Christ, you bear no fruit. He says, I am the true vine. He is the great I am. He was the greatest teacher with the greatest lesson, great position, and the great I am, which leads us to the great commission in the last five minutes. He's great. I mean, what can you say about Jesus? He's great. But he's better than great. All morning long, I've been trying to, trying to come up with a word that's better than great. And we could probably go around, the, go around the room and just start taking what's better than great. I mean, you go to a buffet and you get a good meal and you go, man, that was great. That's great. You know the idea that I get with great? When something's great, it's something that brings me joy. It's something that brings me peace. It's something that brings me fulfillment. That's great. Great has the, the ideology here that, that it's, it's higher. It's bigger. You know, you got bad. You got poor. You got good. And then you got great. Great. Or another word for great would be excellent. He's excellent. He's supreme. He's everything. He's, he's our spiritual source for living. He's how we get by. So it's interesting as I'm sitting here reading this, thinking that a Pharisee would approach Jesus and say, You're, you're a great teacher. You, you must come from God. Not, not like God, but you come from God. You're a great teacher. You teach great things. things that, the, the things that come out of your mouth, they can only be of God. And then Jesus gives them the greatest lesson that he could ever hear, which is you've got to be saved. You must be saved. And then we know that he's not just a great teacher. He's a great physician. He's the great I am. He's great at everything he does. And I, and I was going to take the time to go through this morning and, and look at Genesis. And we can look at Genesis and say, he is, he is, he's great in creation. We could go into Exodus and say, he is, he is great in deliverance. And we could go through in numbers and, 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 and the law, and, and he's great in the law. And we can get all the way to the Gospels and say, he's great in his saving power. And we can go all the way through. He's great. He's great in everything. You know, if we come across something that's great, we like to talk about it. I had a, uh, an electrician that, that has come doing some work over there, and Jeff did some preliminary work. Seems like every time he walks in the door, he goes, pretty good. He knows what he's doing. I said, yeah, yeah. Hmm. It's all right. But it's interesting. When you do something good, people talk about it. So I, I like it when Scott messes up on barbecue. Because even his mess-ups are good. Bring me barbecue. I, 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 there are things that are good. I think of Jimmy Don. Jimmy Don, he, he, he knows small engines. He's good. 
great. And many of you have talents. I mean, there's good, it's great. And, and when you're at the top of your talent, when you do what you do well, people go, that's great. That's good. And we go around and we talk about how good something is and how great something tastes and how wonderful something is. But we have and serve the greatest of all, the one that exceeds all expectations. He's not just a great teacher. He's God. And he's the greatest of all. And there are no words to even define or explain what he is. And yet we keep silent about it. Because the final words that the greatest teacher ever said to his disciples was, Go. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. My dad used to say, that's, a, that's threefold. He used to say, win them, wet them, and work them. Get them saved, get them baptized, and then disciple them. And a lot of times we forget about the discipleship part of it. Threefold. It's the great commission. Jesus told his disciples, he said, now, what I've taught, and watch, what I've taught you, now you go teach the greatest teacher with the greatest lesson who's even greater than that because he's the great physician and he's the great I am he's as great as he can be gave us the great commission so I just want to leave it with you this morning on this note if he's so great let's tell some Let's tell somebody. If he's so great, let's tell somebody. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the... Now watch. Even unto the end of of the world. Can I just say, it doesn't matter what happens in Russia and Ukraine, he's great. It, it doesn't matter how high the gas price gets, he's still great. He's still great. Even to the end of the world. We have been given the great commission. And that is to go tell what we've learned from the greatest teacher. Go share the greatest lesson ever learned. Because he is the greatest teacher. But he's so much bigger than that. He's a great physician. He's the great I am. He is the great everything. The greatest there is. So let's not be silent about it. And all God's people said. Stand in your feet this morning.